This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Shapeshift.io. With no account or sign-up required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell Litecoin, Counterparty, Dogecoin, Dash, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to Shapeshift.io to instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. Hello, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with uh, uh, Trent McConaughey. He's the CTO of Ascribe, and I've, I've known Trent for quite a while. He is also in Berlin, and he works in a really interesting startup that uses the blockchain to sort of solve the problem of ownership in the digital space. So Trent, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, it's really a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he, Trent gave a talk recently at the Bitcoin Meetup, and it was, I mean, we talked about a scribe and what they wanted to do a few times before, but the talk I thought was really, was really good and sort of really, uh, you know, brought forth this vision that you guys have. So I thought it would be great to, to have you on because it's also, I think it's a really, really good use case of people doing something with the blockchain, you know, that goes beyond the usual money transaction uh, context. So, uh, well, Trent, to get started, can you tell us a little bit about Ascribe and, and what the problem is you guys are trying to solve? Uh, sure. So, um, in general, um, it's a problem that exists with digital property, and it gets even worse when it's on the internet. And the problem is that it's really difficult for creators of digital content to get compensated fairly for their work. Um, and it's also difficult for consumers to consume work, um, works sometimes and all that. But it really comes down to the creators. How do you get paid when you create stuff? And um, Ascribe is really trying to address that um, in order to help the creators get compensated, in order to help um, audiences get the content they want, in order to help connectors, marketplaces, and so on, um, have authentic digital content. So that's kind of the problem that we're attacking. And it really is an internet scale problem. And so we've actually, some of the technologies we're deploying are internet scale. Um, there's really kind of two major pieces um, to the approach. One of them is easy, secure legals. And the other thing is visibility into usage of the content. So the legals, um, ha um, the easy part of the legals is um, basically formalizing the existing copyright rights that creators have. And the secure legals, this is basically um, recording transactions in the blockchain, so time stamping, so leveraging the, the time stamping aspect of the blockchain to record these transactions that are um, already legally binding from the contracts. So, and then, yeah. so be maybe before we dive into the, mm -hmm. the specifics of Ascribe, uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to spend a little bit more time on this problem. I mean, I, I think to some extent we're all a little bit aware of it, you know, uh, I mean, Everybody will have heard or will be aware of uh, file sharing, right? There's a uh, BitTorrent, and and then you know we all know, um, yeah, pr the problem of piracy, and then we know what the record labels, for example, do to try to prevent that, which which then again can be a problem for consumers. But can we can we spend a little bit? more time on, on fleshing out exactly what the reason is and, and why this is not working at the moment? Sure, um, definitely. So kind of throw a rock um, and you'll find a problem um, when it comes to ownership of digital property in the web. You talked about piracy and all of that. A lot of the time people don't want to be pirates. They're happy to pay fair price for work, um, but uh, it just isn't convenient. So for example, when iTunes came out, actually, as the years have worn on with iTunes and Spotify and the like, um, piracy has gone down um, of, of music simply because the experience was good enough that people were willing to pay a fair price for that. Um, and another example, uh, you know, I live in, in Berlin, but my German is really pretty terrible. So um, I want to see new release movies in English online, you know, just as soon as they come out on DVD. But I can't legally here in Berlin. Um, I can go to iTunes. Um, Germany, but it will only give me the um, German version. I can try to, um, you know, sign into iTunes in my Canadian account, but it notices my ISP and doesn't let me. Uh, I can try to use Netflix, but it doesn't have the new movies. 
And there's really, you know, Amazon also, it has just the um, German versions. So the only way that I can actually get a movie that's English, that's new release, is if I VPN or, or torrent it. And I don't want to be a pirate. So that's really a problem. There really should be a, a convenient way for my, um, for consumers who want to view content, who want to pay a fair price, to use it. Um, so, you know, there's many, many examples. That's a couple. Um, and, you know, you talked about DRM. In general, uh, DRM is sort of this idea that goes back decades, this idea of trying to take a lock uh, and put it around a digital file, and then this you know, magical, mystical hope that if you put a lock on that file, maybe people will never, ever crack it. But you know, that's kind of fighting the physics of bits. As soon as one person has cracked the key, then it's gone for good. You know, With um, DVDs, Sony and a bunch of other companies had spent millions to create a um, crypto cryptography DRM for DVDs. Within a couple of days of DVDs being released, it was cracked. And at first, Sony and the, the other guys, they thought, oh, yeah, yeah, it must be some big, well-funded corporation. No, it was just a guy. His name was John. <laughs> he cracked it. He was just a kid, <laughs> right? DVD John. So um, the point, and what the point is, once that was cracked, it was out there for good. So in general, you know, um, DRM has been an idea for a long time, but it's really against the physics of bits, right? Um, you, you copy, 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 as Amanda Palmer puts it. Um, it really shouldn't be trying to lock down the content itself. It should be about trying to protect the ownership of the title to that content. So it's the difference between access and title. And that's really kind of, you know, everyone has been getting that confused. And at Ascribe, what we're trying to do is really help people to nail down the title itself, to transfer ownership of the title, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you, you mentioned something that hits really close to home for me, man. It's like trying to watch American or North American content in English legally. It's it's just impossible to do in Europe without without going through pirated uh, content. So. Uh, and there's one quote that always sticks to my mind, and I can't remember who said it exactly, but it was on some podcast somewhere. I heard someone say, "Like, it's this is so this is so absurd. Like, I want to watch this, but there's some idiot with a law degree that is preventing me from doing so because I I, I, I don't understand why I'm pressing myself. So, but um, yeah, it is a huge problem. How does uh, what what has changed now, and how does blockchain technology? potentially solve that uh, where we didn't have solutions before. Right. I mean, so the uh, the Ascribe solution um, leverages blockchain as part of the um, overall technology um, and legal framework to solve this. It isn't just blockchain. Um, you know, you, it's, uh, it's a combination of things. So the blockchain, um, it's really sort of three things. There's the um, the legal side, and then there's the visibility side, and together they, they constitute um, the value. So um, really, to be able to establish ownership, I mean, as a creator, as soon as you, you know, as soon as you create a file, a, a piece of art, whatever, you're the um, you have the copyright rights. Um, but it's really hard for people to um, to transfer that, and if someone else tr claims those copyright rights, what recourse do you have to say that you had it first? And you know, sometimes artists they will actually take a USB file and mail um, a USB stick, put their file on that, and mail it to themselves back and forth and back and like in the mail just to sort of have that proof. Um, what the blockchain does is it's sort of like taking a, uh, and putting a file into a USB and mailing it to yourself, except it's much much more convenient. So you get that sort of legally binding timestamp that you had access to that file at that point in time. And then the, the second part is you know when you're transferring ownership, what that comes down to is um, bequeathing a portion of your um, copyright rights, the beneficial use rights, um, to uh, the purchaser, and then they can transfer it, and so on and so forth. Traditionally, this has only been the realm of the big corporations, you know, the guys who can hire teams of lawyers to keep away us Canadians from from watching, you know, the latest new release. But um, what Ascribe is doing, thanks to partly blockchain, thanks to the right legals and other technology, is rather than just making this the realm of the enterprise, it can be the realm of the individual. So, so go ahead. When you mentioned transferring ownership, and we were talking about this before the show, and, mm -hmm. and it's something that I've been thinking about since mm -hmm. doing this research, is in a digital realm, mm -hmm. is ownership really desirable? I guess is one part of the question or discussion we can have. And the other part is, do we have this notion of scarcity in the digital realm that we have with physical art? Or should be, there be this notion of scarcity? 
And by yeah. that, I mean, so you have a, a piece of art. Okay, so I've got this like mask on my wall here that somebody made. Okay, well, I can touch it. I can feel it. Uh, it's nice. And I know that there was an artist that worked on this. And that gives it more value to me than if it was some like plastic knockoff from uh, made in China. Um, with, uh, with digital art, you don't really have that because it's just bits, right? And I would go to as far as saying that like, if I look at the Mona Lisa for the first time, if I look at it as just a JPEG, I'll still be moved by it. I'll still be inspired by what the artist was trying to put out. So it seems like as soon as you get into the digital space, there are a whole bunch of things that don't exist in, in the physical realm. Yeah, so... Um so to answer your question, there were sort of two questions there. Um, can you have scarcity in digital? And uh, what about the idea of property in digital at all? And this idea of property in digital at all, it actually goes back to um, the very idea of intellectual property. If you think about the word intellectual property, intellectual means ideas, and property means, well, to own something, right? And um, it goes back, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, in fact, the very, one of the very first copyright cases was in the 1600s where people were fighting over a book and 3,000 people died in a battle over a book, actually, in Ireland, of all places. And um, it, because it was about the copyright rights. And so the question is, is it desirable for someone to have, to be able to own an idea? Well, if you're the author of that book and you just spent the last five years of your life writing it, how do you feel if um, everyone has just as much right of you as you in order to uh, make money from it? And... You know, that's, that, that's not very fair. So the, the idea of owning your ideas that you put hard work into as a creator, that's the core idea of intellectual property. Um, copyright is about um, works like books and music and so on. There's um, inventions, which is what patent law covers. And then there's trademarks, which is um, logos and these sorts of things. And each of them is sort of a, a piece of overall intellectual property, the idea of owning ideas. Um, so now the question is, can you translate these existing intellectual property rights into bits? And the answer is actually yes, um, simply because they're already ephemeral. They're already you know, not tangible. It's an idea. You can't really put your hands around it and grasp it. So it's, um, you can use bits to record that you have title, but um, it's always been something that is, it's not tangible. Um, so I, I think that's how it relates. And then just to, sort of your final question uh, sort of had been related to the idea of what about multiple editions? You know, um, what about having five or ten editions? You can do that with, um, you know, books and otherwise, but does it make sense for digital? And, well, if you look at it, there are actually, the idea of editions goes back hundreds of years, and there's always been a debate. But at the end, um, editions have always emerged. You go back to the time of Rodin, uh, there's actually 20 copies of The Thinker out there in the world. Um, and there is one um, cast for all those 20 bronze sculptures of the thinker. Uh, photography, there was debates for actually decades on the idea that you could have multiple prints, but that's been resolved. Um, etchings, all of these things, um, there, there's actually been limited editions. And part of the reason actually is going back is simply to help compensate the creator. So it's basically the creator is bestowing the copyright rights in order to get compensated. If you could have a million copies um, that, or a million editions, then it wouldn't be as, as valuable. It might not be um, possible for the creator to get his copyrights. Right. So in terms of, it, of, of editions, that's the, I guess it, it, it's with editions that I have the most problem with, I don't see the, the value in having editions in the digital realm because it's just bits and you can make as many as you want without, in, without any work, you know? Well, I, I, would, I would suggest like that. Uh, let's come back to this sort of general question. But I think let's talk first about the sort of the example of the digital art market, because I think there it's, it's an interesting example. And I think it kind of makes a lot of sense there. And uh, it's, it becomes much more uh, complicated to wrap your head around this when you talk about a song, for example, like, do you have an interest in owning a song if all you want to do is listen to it, right? But uh, let's talk about the digital art market, because I think that's a, it's a great example, and that's the, also what you guys are focusing on uh, at the moment. Uh, yeah, sure. So digital art is our initial market. We're also spending time with photography and 3D, but focusing on digital art. So in the world of, in the world of digital art, um, 
which is basically pieces of art that are created digitally and um, transmitted digitally. So like an image or a movie, these sorts of things that, um, you know, you, when you would transfer ownership, it's actually ideally transferring it um, as a file as opposed to putting on, it onto, say, a VCR and gluing the VCR lid shut, which is actually what people have done in the past. <laughs> um, so in, in the world of art, the most important thing for value um, of a piece is provenance, the ownership history. And so let's say you have something that it looks 500 years old, but you don't know who the owner was for 50 years, the value is going to be a lot lower. And um, if you have it and you don't know the, the provenance at all, um, then the value is essentially zero. Um, sometimes you can even recover the provenance. You know, there's this example of the, the Fabergé egg where someone bought it in a flea market for $5,000 or so, and they tried to sell it for scrap metal, but no one would buy it. So they ended up Googling around and discovering that it was a Fabergé egg dating back to the time of Peter the Great. And then it got sold in auction for tens of millions of dollars. So in that example, the provenance was recovered. And thanks to a sufficient documentation on the internet, um, in, the um, in the archives of the Armitage, et cetera, um, the, the, value, the provenance is recovered and the value shot up to tens of millions. In the world of digital and with files, there hasn't traditionally been provenance. And because of that, there hasn't been a way to really lock down the value of these digital files that gets transmitted. And because of that, the, the digital art market hasn't really taken off. So the overall size of the art market itself is, depending who you ask, 50 billion, 60 billion, 70 billion, somewhere in there. So it's bigger um, or par with movies, with internet advertising, with video games. It's that sort of size of market. But um, digital art is... Um, depending what numbers you look at, it's somewhere between 100 million and a few hundred million. So it's it's really a, a, a fraction, which is kind of amazing given that it's 2015, you know, this age of social networks and digital everything, except for the art market. So, um, and really there, um, people in the art world have called it an elephant in the room problem that, you know, it's 2015, digital everywhere, yet we don't have digital art um, in a broad sense. And it's because this provenance problem has not been properly solved until now, of course. So um, basically, by using the, um, the combination of transfer of copyright rights um, in embedded in a contract and recorded on the blockchain, that enables digital provenance in a perfect kind of fashion. Um, as long as the blockchain is around or mirrors and copies are made, then that provenance is around. And that's basically provenance that did not exist before. So it solves this very, very root core problem of digital art. And hopefully, you know, it will make a, a pretty big um, impact on the art industry. So, so if I can be phrase that, right? So the problem before was, let's say you created this digital work of art, and then I'm the artist, and I want to sell that. Well, with art, the, the concept of scarcity is kind of very central. Right? If you're an art collector, you don't want to buy this thing if, a million other people can have it as well, or if if you're not, you know, if it's not rare in some in some way, and of course with digital uh, files, uh, how could it be? I mean, it's uh, I mean, and maybe the artist can promise you he only gives it to you and a few other people, but then you kind of have to trust that, uh, you know, trust his word, and then you don't know what these other people are going to do. Maybe because once they have the file, of course they could give it to other people, and if there's no no record of who owns this, then like, why would anybody pay for this? It just, it, it makes sense that this doesn't work, right? And then, but of course, if you bring the blockchain in, you sort of register the piece of art in the blockchain and say, oh, there's only five of those. And, you know, now you sell it to me and I can check in the blockchain that I own one of them and they're only five and I can transfer it on. And, and that person then has it and it's clear I don't have it anymore. So that kind of, uh, yeah, sort of solves that problem. I mean, of course, it separates, and I think that's also very interesting when we talk about the distinction between the physical and the digital, right? In the, in the physical one, you have sort of the file or the, the content, the, the object, and the ownership of that is, is the same thing, right? Like either you, ha you have the painting and you also own the painting. Uh, but then digitally, this could be different, right? So I could own this uh, work of art, uh, and someone, and I have it, the file, the physical, uh, digital file, and someone else also has the file, but doesn't own the art, right? So you're sort of separating those two, which is very interesting. And then I think that's also where it gets confusing because 
in some instances, you're like, why would I pay more for owning it when I can just have it? But of course, in, I think in the digital art market, it's totally obvious because if you're a collector, well, then you care about ownership, right? That's very central. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's you, you, you put, you hit the nail on the head. It's really about the difference between access and ownership. And then interestingly, you know, if you have a piece of digital art, you actually want people to share it, make a million copies, because it's actually a proxy for value. If you can see that there's a million shares of your work, it probably means that you know there's someone out there who's going to want to pay money to actually have the title to that or one of the titles to it, right? So um, it's it's kind of cool that. Um, this distinction is not only useful um, to really establish ownership, but also as a proxy for value. Doesn't that sort of break the model where by having ownership, you're in a position of power because you essentially control the distribution of that piece of art, being able to display it in a gallery, for example, or sell it to the highest bidder. Whereas if you don't, if you can just uh, have copies online, uh, whether or not you own them or not, People are still going to be able to 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 look at them and to, to uh, um, yeah to experience the art, right? Yeah. So in general, like I mean, you can't fight the physics of bits, right? I mean, you can try to take a file and lock it down or watermark it or something, but um, you know, ultimately, that all of that's going to just you know break. And we've seen you know that happen with the attempts of DRM over the last decades, and it hasn't worked. Um, to say to own something, it's a funny concept a bit. Um, it's a bit like the word consciousness. You know, when, you're, when you use the word consciousness when trying to describe the brain, there's a lot of different interpretations of what it means. And it ends in a lot of, and sometimes arguments, et cetera, and strong philosophies, et cetera. Um, so ownership of physical is, is pretty straightforward. You're holding it. Um, et cetera, it's yours. Um, in digital, it's sort of, as Brian was pointing out, it's a little bit different. But the cool thing is, when it comes to um, media, whether it be digital art or 3D designs or music, all this sort of stuff, um, you can actually unpack the word ownership into something that actually has a legal meaning, and that's copyright law, right? So um, copyright law is designed exactly to protect um, the creators and anyone who gets the copyright rights. So to say that you, you know, if you, if you create something, you can say that you own it, um, and that translates exactly to saying you have the copyright rights to transfer ownership that means, as a creator, you're you're bestowing copy, uh, a portion of the copyright rights to whoever buys that piece. And then, you know, as person A sells to person B, person B sells to person C, that's actually a transfer of the copyright rights. So um, the title. And to your to your point of sort of distribution, um, you can't you know stop the flow of bits in a sense. If someone has a copy and they want to you know spread it throughout the world. Um, you know, you can't sort of plug the internet that way, right? You can try, and you know, big corporations in the past have tried, um, but it doesn't work very well, right? Um, but if you are a copyright owner and someone out there is um, has taken your work and is trying to sell it on a website, you actually have legal recourse to approach the person on that website and tell them to take it down. And if they don't, um, you can have legal proceedings against them. Um, a, a wiser strategy would simply to um, try to monetize it, to say, hey, you know, you've been using this. How about you give me 50 euros or 500 euros for your efforts? And um, there actually are companies out there who do this for certain types of media. Um, it's just sort of a, a business to business sort of thing right now, though. Um, we see that um, these sorts of things, um, if you have the right technologies like blockchain and really easy to use legals, then you can bring it to the individual. So in a sense, just like PayPal brought um, transfers of money um, between individuals and then Bitcoin too now, um, think of us as a PayPal for ownership, a PayPal for digital IP, where you can transfer digital IP from person to person without needing an army of lawyers behind you. Our show today is brought to you by our friends at Shapeshift. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to trade altcoins. They now support over 25 of the most popular altcoins, including Dogecoin, Counterparty, Dash, Monero, and so many others. When you want to trade altcoins, forget about using an exchange. That's so 2013, man. Just go to shapeshift.io and get it done in less than one minute with no account or sign-up required. Their currency conversion tool makes trading altcoins as easy and convenient as using Google Translate. Here's how this works. You head over to shapeshift.io, you tell them which currency you want to sell, and give them the wallet address for the currency you want to buy. Let's say you want to sell some Dogecoin, they get some Dash. You then simply send the Dogecoins to the address they provide you, Shapeshift converts it for you, and puts the Dash directly into your wallet. It's that smooth. 
long gone are the days when you had to give an exchange your passport, tell them your shoe size, wait six confirmations just to buy some popcorn. With Shapeshift, conversions are instantaneous and your privacy remains protected. So head over to shapeshift.io and start trading some altcoins today. We would like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So we talked a little bit about uh, DRM and, and because it's kind of obvious that if you own um, the title uh, of some, let's say, music, then uh, locking down access and charging for access to listen to that music, you know, is, is a great way to monetize. And that's, that's why people want to do this DRM thing, even though maybe uh, it's hard to do it and, and there's a part where, you know, information wants to be free and that sort of stuff. But it, it seems like it would be a great fit or sort of a natural fit if somebody developed a DRM system on top of a scribe, right? Where perhaps the software would check ownership on the, on the blockchain. And, you know, for example, am I allowed to watch this movie? Uh, and, you know, if so, I can see it. If not, I can't. And that perhaps would also, I mean, it's a strange idea to think about, right? Because then you could have a, maybe a secondary market. Let's say I buy uh, some Hollywood movie, I watch it, and then I can transfer the ownership to someone else so they can watch it. I can maybe sell it on. Uh, have you thought about that? And, and what's your view of the idea of, of sort of putting a DRM system on top of a scribe? Right. So uh, when I think about DRM, I sort of think about um, like taking a file and putting a lock around it or maybe putting on some like hidden watermark or something. But um, and I think that's you know, there's other ways, though. What you're talking about is it was a bit of that. But the other half was sort of a way to monetize in sort of a rental framework. Right. So people can rent um, stuff from you. And, and so this is something that we actually um, have uh, lead users for and we're building as we speak to support the rental um, and lo rentals and loans. So for example, um, I'm an artist, I want to loan a, a piece of work to a museum and I want that loan to actually be recorded on the blockchain. So um, this functionality, you know, this is very important because you know, if, you, if you loan to MoMA or Louver, then you're going to, the value of your work will go up. And then a rental is just simply a loan with dollars attached, right? And um, you can think of it as also related to um, ownership or more generally copyright rights. So doing a loan means you are bestowing um, a certain amount of copyright rights for private or public viewing for a limited period of time in a limited context. And so that is exactly you know, part of um, what a scribe is helping to support. If people want to build systems where you're, you know, you're like a video rental store, um, or some sort of loaning, renting marketplace on top of Ascribe, great, right? Ascribe is simply a service. You know, our, our, our main um, way of people interacting with us is via the API in that sense. Um, we have a web app, we have an API. But for this sort of thing, it would be our API, and we're really just a service. So yes, definitely, we've thought about it a lot. Well, but let's, let's talk about this idea of the internet of ownership and in the talk you gave at the meetup in Berlin, you talked about this really interesting uh, project called Xanadu that kind of had this vision a long, long time ago. Yeah, I'd love to. So, um, and if you don't mind, I'd like to sort of backtrack a couple, like um, t take a few minutes just to elaborate because um, it's, it's pretty cool. So if you sort of think about why um, ownership of digital property, especially on the internet, is a mess, um, you kind of first of all have to go to more near-term internet history, and that's the World Wide Web. And in 1989, uh, Tim Berners-Lee um, drafted the concept of the World Wide Web in March of 89. By Christmas of 1990, he'd actually implemented the whole first cut, the first web server, the first uh, web page, uh, HTML, um, all these sorts of components that were needed to uh, build the World Wide Web. And then in the 25 years since that happened, the World Wide Web has exploded. You know, that's where we have Amazon and Facebook and all of these other, you know, billions, literally, of websites now. And, uh, but at, at, the, at the core of the, the World Wide Web, it has um, a challenge. If someone, take, someone can take my file and use it and I don't hear about it, they can even link to me and I don't even hear about it. And this is because the World Wide Web only has unidirectional links. So it only points one way. I can link to your web page, but you don't know about that I'm linking to your web page unless you happen to be on my web page. And um, so that's really kind of the core challenge. Um, 
of, of the World Wide Web. It's these sort of very mindless links, and it has no um, sort of rights management built in. Now, going to the Xanadu, as you'd mentioned, um, you know, we'd been uh, digging more into this and whatnot, and we we found that um, there was a vision going back to 1960. A guy by the name of Ted Nelson, um, he, and he had this project called Xanadu. And in fact, Ted Nelson coined the term hypertext. Um, and Xanadu was the original hypertext project. And the vision was basically so, um, a, a hypertext um, place, just like World Wide Web, you know, where you have documents linking to documents, but having rights management and attribution built in. And uh, his design was simply um, bidirectional links rather than unidirectional links. And that way, so if you link to my web page, I know about it directly because I have linked back to you. That's just built into the protocol. And the second thing is copyright was built in, baked in. So um, if, I'm, if I'm established as the copyright holder, if you link to me then, um, and you start making money, I'm going to have a trickle of dollars coming down to me as well. So that was kind of an amazing vision, actually. Um, and this goes back to the 60s. And you know Ted Nelson, um, you know after he had that vision, um, he actually spent decades um, working on it, refining it, and so on. Started a company in the 80s um, to roll this out, but it was really hard to build. It was actually pretty complicated. And so when the World Wide Web came out in 1990, it kind of just took off so much more quickly because it was so simple, and kind of left Xanadu in the dust. But the vision of Xanadu, this idea of of proper attribution and rights management built in, um, that's still a, an extremely worthy vision. And we really love that vision. Um, you know, that's basically where, uh, you know, you look at all these different problems on the internet, and it comes down to the fact that, you know, there isn't built-in attribution. Um, you know, throw a rock at a vertical and you, you get a problem, whether it's music, etc. cetera. Um, and Xanadu really was trying to address that, right? Um, there's this great quote from, um, from Ted Nelson. HTML is precisely what we are trying to prevent Ever breaking links, no right, ma no rights management. So anyway, that that's the idea of Xanadu. Uh, we think it's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, others have tried to solve this since, like you know, for example, like WordPress has pinned back. You know, so there's been other technologies uh, developed, uh, proprietary or open source, that uh, enable this sort of like uh, ability to see who's linking back to you. But yeah, having having that uh, embedded into the core technologies, I I, I guess would have been uh, pretty useful and valuable. Yeah, yeah. No, I, no, I agree, uh, for sure. So uh, how does that tie into uh, Eurovision, this, this idea of bidirectional links? Right, so um, directly, actually. So um, you can kind of summarize what Xanadu is trying to do and what we're trying to do with, um, we, we, we say, where is my stuff? And you can break that down into the where's and my stuff. And the where's is really um, Xanadu solved it with bidirectional links that are sort of like created automatically by the protocol on the fly when you create a new page. And then the my stuff that Xanadu had was baked in copyright. So just sort of everything built into the system. And there was these ideas of a bunch of things like transclusions and meta structures and so on. That was the Xanadu design. Um, the, with Ascribe, we're also um, boiling down the problem we're trying to solve as where is my stuff, but we're solving it slightly differently. So um, the where's part, rather than baking bidirectional links into a protocol, we're crawling the web. So we're swallowing the web and then automatically computing those bidirectional links for media. And so I mean, lots of you know, several people have done this over the years. Several groups, you know, in 1998, Larry Page was in the shower and he asked, "What if I could swallow the internet?" And um, it was that question that led to him develop him and Larry, um, sorry, him and Sergey, um, developing the backrub algorithm, which evolved into Google. And you know, Google search itself is about you know understanding the links back and forth, you know, the page rank, all that. Um, they were doing it for discovering content. Uh, we're doing it for attribution, and um, it really ties to ownership much more directly. And it's not about a, a web page per se. It's actually about the media itself. So that's the sort of where's and the where's my stuff. The other half, the my stuff part, is um, two parts. And I hinted at this in the beginning. There is the easy legals and the secure legals. So easy legals is a terms of service that has the copyright stuff built in. So um, when you register a piece of work, you are claiming that you have the copyright rights. When you transfer um, ownership, you are bestowing um, a subset of those copyright rights to the next buyer. 
such that that buyer can resell. Um, they can use it for um, public display, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so to summarize, you know, how we relate to Xanadu is Xanadu had this amazing, amazing vision to uh, keep rights management, um, to solve the where's my stuff question. We have the same aim, but um, with Ascribe, we're trying to do it in a much more sort of pragmatic way. So we're not trying to force new protocols right now. We're working with the existing protocols uh, of the internet and then having this sort of overlay on top, um, sort of rewiring at the sort of the very top level to make it really pragmatic. And of course, you know, it, it's still hard, right? I mean, to swallow the internet and then to relate that to content, that's actually an internet scale machine learning problem. But that's exactly what we're good at. You know, in Ascribe, there's a dozen of us um, you know, eight engineering, and of the engineers, five of us have been doing big data and machine learning for um, a long time. So, I mean, this also seems sort of a, a, a crazy, uh, ambitious project, right? And I think when you when you talked about that, I was like, is this really possible? And, and it, so, with with Google, right, one of the things people often talk about is that. If somebody tried to build a you know better search engine than Google now, it would be extremely difficult because of just that enormous server infrastructure and expenses that they've had. So you can, like your startup costs would be huge, and you know it's like of course still, still very risky. Are you able to be so, build something better? So uh, can you guys really do that? And and how how can you guys crawl the entire web and then uh, find those uh, links and attributions? And I presume also it means you would have to, you know, account for different file types, right? Or like, let's say somebody has the same uh, work or image, but in a different, you know, compressed versus not compressed. Like, I mean, you would have to uh, recognize all those things. So how is that really possible? Yeah, so um, first of all, I totally acknowledge that this is crazy ambitious. I agree. <laughs> um, and I also acknowledge that it's really hard. Um, and we see, though, that um, solving ownership on the internet, it's not an easy problem, but it really is worth solving, right? It matters to the future of the internet. It matters for compensating creators, um, as well as for the, the, the consumers, etc. So um, yes, it's ambitious. Yes, it's hard, but we're going for it. And sort of as a team in Ascribe, we have the background to, to actually go for it. You know, the problems that I was solving in my uh, previous work, we were actually looking at where we had 100 billion or even a trillion data points that we had to analyze in the span of 10 minutes or, or an hour um, on a laptop. And we were doing it. And so, and it's not just myself and the team. You know, there's other people on the team who have been doing really hard problems in semiconductors and um, in other big data realms. So if you have the experience um, and the audacity, um, then you really can go for it. And we kind of have both. So um, to your question of, of different file formats, et cetera, um, this isn't about just searching for the hash of the file, because someone can change a single bit, and then the hash is different. So you can't go based on file names or hashes. You actually have to do a content-based search, right? And, um, and then basically, the content-based search, you have to do this for different media types. You have to do it for images, for, for movies, for 3D designs, and so on. Um, right now, we're doing it for two types of media. We're doing it for images, and we're doing it for 3D files. Actually, I think we might be the very first company in the world that's doing a 3D file similarity search. Um, and we'll be doing for more as we go along. And uh, so we're doing this, and um, really, to you know, we, we have uh, a given image we're comparing against when someone registers an image or they want to track what's going on. We actually compare that against the reference database of images that we've crawled. And you know, depending how you count it, depending sort of how deep in the web you go, it could be 10 billion images, it could be 500 billion. And um, this is possible thanks to cloud infrastructure. So we're using Amazon very heavily. Um, actually, it's kind of funny. Uh, Amazon um, sort of tracked us down in Berlin, and they're like, who are you guys? Why are you using such a crazy amount of compute power? You know, like this tiny little startup in Berlin that's using more compute power than like super established startups. Like, what's going on, right? But um, you know, this is possible now if you have, you know, you, you leverage technology in the right way. You have the um, the right team to really pull it off. Um, that's what we're doing, and. Um, I, I, and it really, you know, it's not just, you know, sort of image search or media search. It ties to ownership. And this is really the key. There's sort of this multiplicative value of when you actually combine those two things. Um, because then you can start to a ask questions like, okay, this is the file that I own. Um, when has it been used in the last month by others? How many people have used it? Who's using it? What value are people getting? 
And those are really useful. And then you can make a call yourself on what do you want to do about it, right? Um, do you want to just let go because, you know, virality is a proxy for value? Or maybe you want to um, charge license fees? Or maybe you want to do a takedown request? Um, you know, but it's up to you. And we're giving that power to the users, the individuals. And we think so that's really powerful. Yep. So does that mean if I'm an artist and now I'm going to register my digital work of art or something on a scribe, at some point in the future, you will provide like analytics services that where you can see yeah, what's happening with that, where does that go? Yeah, that's correct. And it's in the very near future. So we're actually already doing this for beta customers, um, businesses, where um, they are using our service um, to um, basically compare their content against what's out there on the internet. And we will be rolling this into the web app for um, individuals in the next uh, two to six weeks, um, actually maybe sooner. So. Yeah, so a few months ago or a year ago or something, I was approached by a, a very large publisher who were interested in uh, DRM and, uh, and publishing and whether the blockchain could be some help there. And the interesting thing is that they weren't necessarily so much against the idea of, of people sharing the content and being passed on because, you know, they had, for example, for the newspapers, they know that in average three people read them, right? So they, they get passed on and family members or they're in a restaurant or something. And then that's really valuable information for them to sell the advertising. And they they were like, oh, if this could happen in the digital realm, that would be okay too, right? So if people pass it on, but we need to know, we need to have the analytics there and understand like, where does it end up? Like, what do people do with it in order to sell ads effectively? So I guess this is sort of it ties in a bit there too, you know, that you, you might be able to provide some of that intelligence. And then that's certainly really fascinating. Uh, definitely, yeah. Um, you know, what we're doing um, is it's really sort of pro-creator across the board. So creators that are individuals who want to monetize individually, but also, um, you know, larger corporations that are proxies for creators to help that way, you know, journalists working for newspapers, et cetera. And so we do work with, um, you know, larger businesses as well to help them um, to monitor the internet um, for their content or other content. Um, you know, the Ascribe solution um, scales to that, right? So, you know, we're working with companies that have tens of millions of users. I'm curious. Um, so you mentioned a while ago about the data analysis that you were doing. What uh, are you using Erlang for that? Uh, I do love Erlang, uh, but we are using Python. So okay, um, let's maybe get into some of the technical components uh, of uh, a scribe, and maybe you can describe a spool. Sure. So um, spool is uh, the protocol, the blockchain overlay um, for the transactions related to ownership. So when we developed Spool, we actually looked around at all the different other sort of protocols that have been emerging that sit on top of the blockchain, things like open assets and counterparty and all of these. And you know, those are pretty cool. We, we like that, we, we talked to some of those guys and, um, but they didn't have quite the feature sets that we needed and they didn't sort of address the law in the way that we needed to address the law here. So in the feature sets, you know, we wanted things like unique additions. Uh, we want, you know, if you register um, where you have 10 unique editions, you need to be able to distinguish edition three from edition four. Whereas these other protocols, they would say, okay, I've got 10 e-gold, right? Um, but, and you transfer three e-gold at a time, but it doesn't matter which three in a sense. And then we also wanted things like um, loans, consignment, um, you know, having someone else sell on your behalf, unconsignment, um, rentals, these sorts of things. And so these, these different features, um, the other protocols simply just didn't support those. And when we looked sort of, um, if you merged our protocol with another one, we looked at that as well, there was very little overlap, really just sort of only the transfer part. So we, we decided that we would just um, have our own protocol called Spool, Secure Public Online Ownership Ledger, um, as a blockchain overlay. And the specification is actually quite simple. Uh, we've actually put it online onto GitHub. Um, it's github.com slash ascribe slash spool. And, we'll put um, it in the, the link in the show notes as well. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. And um, so that's, that's the general idea of sort of the features. Um, and the main features are registering and, trans um, and transferring ownership. Um, the other aspect, though, that sort of sets it apart from other protocols is that it's really not about transferring tokens that are sort of like a, a coin that's colored or something. It's really much more about time stamping ownership transactions. So it's much more saying, I declare that I have this ownership now, you know, 
this is not law. Law is law. The code is simply code. Um, but it's code that could be used as evidence in a court of law. So that's really how we're leveraging the blockchain. And, um, and then, you know, when you transfer uh, ownership, it goes from, um, you know, one address that owns it. So there's sort of an address that owns a given um, addition, say addition number two or three. So when you transfer, there's a transaction where it's going from the existing input to a new input to a new um, sort of address. And um, that's the transaction for transferring ownership. And sort of as this goes along, as you transfer from owner A to B to C, you have this sort of provenance that emerges naturally. And it's really easy to look on a blockchain explorer and stuff too. So you can go to blockchain.info or whatever and see this chain of, of transactions going from person A to person B to person C. But all of this going back, it's not about some sort of token that um, gets passed along. It's much more about recording actions that can be used as evidence in a court of law. And actually, as a really cool aside, um, the blockchain has already been used as evidence in a court of law. Maybe you guys heard uh, Andreas Antonopoulos was telling me it was used on the, in the Silk Road trials, actually. Yeah. Um, so um, we're like, thank you, Silk Road. Um, <laughs> but it shouldn't really be surprising, right? Like hard drives have been used as evidence in courtrooms for you know decades. So um, something like the blockchain, which is um, you know even more even less hard to tamper with, should it should be obvious. So we're happy about that. Go ahead. Sorry. So, so then just to sum up how this works, a, a scribe is sort of a certificate authority then in that case. Uh, there's a hash that's embedded in the blockchain for the proof of existence of this file, for instance. It could be like a picture or a 3D file. And then for every edition, you would, descend, you would have a transaction that is issued to, um, to the edition holder. And then as they transfer that, uh, they're transferring ownership essentially. Yeah, exactly. So as yeah. long as you have the private key, you're the owner of this file. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, so maybe I'll just describe to be very precise. In that registration tran uh, transaction, the input is an ascribe address. There are several outputs. Let's say you have three editions. Then the first output would be a hash of the file plus the title of the artist plus the, the um, title of the work, the name of the artist, the title of the work, um, the year, and then uh, you would have th uh, three outputs for each, one output for each edition, um, one output for change, and one output for uh, an op return, which is like a verb saying register or transfer, or whatever. So that's what the transaction looks like. And yes, exactly like you said, Sebastian, um, if, you are, if you have the private key to say the address of edition two of three, uh, then by, the, by definition, according to the terms of service, um, you are the owner of that piece of work. And so, yeah, so how does how does a loan loaning uh, some an an addition or piece of artwork? Yeah, well, um, so I mean, when you're transferring ownership or loaning, these are all about um, bestowing or transferring a portion of copyright rights from person A to person B. So a loan looks a lot like a transfer of ownership. It's just um, more copyright rights that are more limited in scope. Um, on the blockchain, um, the transaction is shaped very similarly. So um, you have uh, the existing owner um, of, of the rights, and then to a loan, you basically you have Satoshi's flowing from um, the existing owning address to um, a new address where they're getting the loan. Uh, um, and there is also change, and there's also an op return that has the verb of loan. So, so, so does, but does that mean... I mean, somehow it has to go back to the rights owner, right? If you loan it, and, and I guess, I mean, ideally, you would not have to rely on the person who is loaning the art to send it back to you with a transaction. Ideally, you could say, like, I loan it to you for three months, and then at that stage, it automatically yeah, gets sent exactly. back to me. Does that work like that? Yeah. Or? yeah, you're exactly right. And it's precisely because we're not relying on, it's not you know, coins that have to flow back and forth. This is all timestamps of actions, right? So inside the op return, it says loan, but it also says the start date and the end date of the loan, right? Because it's really, once again, um, documenting um, uh, a contract that has already been signed um, that they've already agreed to. So um, it's not about if someone steals a private key and runs with it, you, you know, you're kind of messed up. It's not that at all. It's simply um, used as a way to document um, these different transactions related to ownership. So th does that mean, for example, you could also restrict then what the 
the person does that loans the object, for example, could you say you're allowed to loan it on or not? Uh, or is there some granularity you have there? Uh, so right now, um, we have sort of good defaults. Um, so typically, it's going from an existing rights holder, um, someone who has an addition or the artist, to um, a single entity. And they don't have the right to reloan, just to how our sort of default contract is. However, we've already began doing custom contracts for people that like to use us. Uh, one of our customers, for example, um, they, yeah, they, they're using it. Uh, I won't get into detail, but, um, and in general, you know, why not have custom contracts for the businesses or the individuals that want it, right? And as time goes on too, we'll, we'll start with good defaults, but we'll also make it easy to sort of switch the contracts. Just like, you know, with Creative Commons, you can go to Creative Commons and choose one of a few contracts in the sort of easy to use fashion. We kind of see that with us too. Today's magic word is ownership. O-W-N-E-R-S-H-I-P. Go to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So Spool is the open source protocol that makes all this happen. Ascribe is the the for-profit company that is uh, creating this protocol and uh, maintaining it, right? Yep. Um, can you talk about the broader, like, full tech stack of what Ascribe is uh, going to be offering? Uh, sure. And so, um, just as an um, addendum to the Spool stuff, um, in the next month, we, we will be open sourcing the a reference implementation of Spool and Python as well. So, and we've actually been having chats with other people in the Bitcoin community um, about using the Spool protocol themselves for. Um, ownership. Uh, I mean, it's sort of a complementary protocol to the other protocols out there, but it's you know it it stands on its own. It's useful. So okay, so I'm going to talk about the tech stack here. Um, there's I'll start at the top. There's two ways you can interact with Ascribe. Um, there's if with the web app directly. So if you go to ascribe.io, um, click sign up, then you can enter your email and um, a password, and then you're in, and then you can register work transfer ownership, all of that. It's really designed to be simple. Um, incidentally, by the way, too, when you're using it, um, you don't have to know about Bitcoin at all. We provide some details down at the bottom, but um, there's Bitcoin being transacted. Transacted, You don't have to worry about it. Um, then the other way that people can interact with Ascribe is uh, via our API. So this is typically for marketplaces or um, galleries with higher throughput, um, these sorts of places. And so they just use our API. So both the marketplaces and our own web app consume uh, this REST API. Um, it's a you know standard RESTful API. We'll be making that um, public shortly too, and that is being served up by our Ascribe servers. And then the servers themselves, they kind of have um, three pillars that they're kind of um, doing un under the hood. And um, so uh, pillar one is, um, and it all relates to answering this question: Where's my stuff? Um, you know, the where's part and the my stuff part. So on the where's part, um, in order to, uh, we do the automatic discovery of bidirectional links, and that comes down to um, the web crawl and then the machine learning similarity search. And of course, um, it's accessing this database, this global database or file system, whatever you want to call it, called the internet. Um, <clears throat> so that's one part of the stack. The other two parts um, that the Ascribe ownership servers are talking about, one of them is the terms of service. Um, which we actually take very, very seriously. We've gone way out of our way to do a good job on this, working with lawyers on multiple continents. And in fact, um, even though we have a, a small team, we already have a full-time lawyer who has lived and breathed copyright law the last 10 years. Um, and he really, really cares about this stuff, about copyright, about privacy, all of these things. Um, actually, his last gig was um, doing a class action lawsuit on behalf of Canadians to Facebook for mucking around with um, Canadians' privacy. So, um, you know, he's, he's really fantastic. We're very happy about that. Um, the third thing that the servers are sort of um, serving up besides the web crawl and the terms of service is um, they're wrapping the, the blockchain stuff. So there's sort of three pieces of that stack. Um, there's the, the, the spool, which is the, the Bitcoin overlay. Um, and then that is, you can think of it like a dialect of the Bitcoin protocol itself which of course is the API for the blockchain itself. So that's sort of the overall tech stack. Um, you know, as far as users are concerned, um, there's really two ways they can interact, right? There's the, the web app and the API. 
The web app is really for individual creators, you know, artists, graphic designers, photographers, writers, musicians. And in that, you know, they can register their work, consign it, and archive. You know, we'll store um, those files on, on the cloud for free. They don't have to worry about that. And individual galleries can use this too, you know, for consignment. And collectors as well. So you can think of it as your sort of digital wallet of your digital art or your 3D files, whatever. Um, the REST API is really targeted towards marketplaces. And there's actually sort of two benefits for them. There's answering the where's my stuff question for themselves. Um, and as well for their users, you know, they can pass that information to the users to say, hey, you know, this is how much your stuff has been shared. So... Uh, yeah, that kind of, and then the, the third um, sort of, you can call it an interface, if you will, is the Spool protocol itself, right? Which, uh, like I've mentioned, yeah, we've we've open sourced it, we've made, we've gone out of a way to make it simple, um, and it's really about the um, the transactions, uh, recording the transactions, such that if there's ever a dispute over ownership, you've got extra evidence for a court of law. It's a really intricate system. I mean, it's. Um it's, you seem to have quite a few pieces there. I guess that's the value that you're that you're providing is having all those pieces together. Uh, I, I, I suppose anybody can use this protocol to build um, similar business models. Yeah, and we encourage people to do so. Actually, um, you know, uh, I think it would be difficult to build a company where you're just hashing a file to the blockchain, right? Um, you know, high school kids can do that. Our initial prototype was, you know, sort of. Um, that that tiny and it was you know straightforward to do sort of a weekend project right so um, but it's really all this extra value that we provide the web crawl stuff get, giving that visibility um, and reconciling this idea of hashing to the file with actual copyright law you know with with the realities of the world and not just you know a, a copyright license but you know being there re, um, coming to bat with um, you know the legals to back it up, with the resources to back it up, and so on. So it really is about an overall solution for for ownership. You know, another way to think about this is you can think of PayPal or Stripe as payment processing. Think of us as ownership processing. So let's talk a little bit about some of the the concrete projects you've been up to. I mean, uh, there's a few times you mentioned to me uh, the website Coin Temporary, which I think is really cool. Uh, yeah, sure. So Cointemporary is um, a, a, a website it's an, um, and an art gallery that every 10 days they sell a new piece of work, a uh, piece of artwork. And um, it's run by a couple artists um, in Vienna, Valentin Rory and Andy Boot. And uh, the only w way you can buy it is with Bitcoin. <laughs> so here's an example where you can go online and you can spend Bitcoin and buy art. Now, up till recently, they had been um, selling physical art. But uh, we've partnered with them, and they are now selling digital art as well. So um, the first um, round of digital art, they started about two weeks ago, selling uh, 50 editions of some work from Valentine. And this past week, um, they've actually been selling work from uh, a quite well-known artist named um, Harm van den Dorpel. Uh, and it's actually a screensaver, <laughs> but you know that's digital art, and so that's been um, you know pretty cool. We've been pretty excited about that. Um, the guys have been fantastic to work with, and uh, actually another sort of really cool um, aside related is um, these editions that of Harm's work um, that are being sold right now. Um, Mac Vienna, which is a 150-year-old art institution um, for uh, including contemporary art, um, they actually bought. Um, copies of ed editions of Harm's work. So we actually have seen instances of blockchain ascribed work being bought by these major art institutions already. So it's happening, right? It's pretty exciting. People have been dreaming and talking about, you know, blockchain and art for a while. You know, we've been talking about it almost two years actually. And it's happening now, right? Um, with successes like Mac and with Cointemporary and so on, we're just really happy to be a part of this and to help you know, bring proper digital ownership to the art world. So, so where do you see this going in the next 12 months? Or like, let's say one to two years. Yeah, so um, right now uh, we're spending a lot of um, uh, energy um, in serving the art world. So we're working with a lot of digital artists and galleries and um, other lar art, larger art institutions, museums, galleries, um, gallery management software, these sorts of companies. Um, for digital art, and actually, interestingly, some have approached us, and we're helping them on physical art as well. Um, it turns out that having really, you know, better provenance for physical art can count for a lot as well. 
And on the side, by the way, we do um, certificate of authenticity. That's cryptographic, so a cryptographic COA. And um, collectors really like that. So that's where, what we've been doing. But also we've been working with marketplaces and individuals for photography and for 3D design, where they also have these challenges. Um, and quite often they start off with one challenge, like, oh, I don't have visibility into what's going on. But um, once they start working with us, they realize, oh, wow, this ownership thing is really awesome. Give, give it all to me, right? I want it all. So we're working with sort of these three initial verticals and really proving it out um, with revenue, actually, which is kind of exciting for us as a company. Um, and uh, we're going to be really you know, driving that. But as we go forward, we're going to be expanding to other verticals as well. Um, but really always sort of art as our core, as a sort of heart and soul, which really fits for Berlin too. Berlin is a company that is art plus tech. Um, so solving a problem that is at the intersection of art plus tech is really exciting to us. Um, and, you know, Ascribe is kind of like that. Now, going beyond, though, we see that, you know, as we go um, address vertical to vertical and really build mind share there um, and usage, then, you know, you co as you cover the verticals, you start to um, address... Um, all the different media types on the web, all the different pain points on the web. So fast forward, you know, one year, five years, 10 years, we see that, you know, we're already internet scale, but we see that we become sort of this horizontal layer um, for the internet, really an ownership layer for the internet. Just like Facebook started out as a site for Harvard students to like, you know, connect with each other and, and poke each other, but it grew to basically being this very horizontal social layer for the internet. Uh, we kind of see ourselves similar. We're, we're starting out solving some very specific pain points in certain verticals, but growing, serving needs of users, of creators, to ultimately become this, this very horizontal ownership layer. And um, we think that's really awesome because um, the internet needs it. It's a hard problem. The internet needs it. And we're working with people who have been architects of the internet to actually deploy this. We'll be announcing some of those names uh, in the next few weeks, actually. Can't, can't tell you now, but we'll say soon. <laughs> so, so that's kind of the vision. It, it's, it, maybe you can clear this up for me. It's unclear to me how, uh, if, if a scribe grows, right, and, yeah. and you become sort of a, an authority um, to, uh, for, for, uh, for copyright uh, and ownership rights online, how how do we avoid getting into another situation where we have these large authorities that essentially have the um, monopoly on the market, uh, much like certificate authorities have now? Yeah. So um, you talk I mean, about it being for horizontal. How does it horizontal, and, and how does it uh, does how 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 does it protect the interests of artists? Right. For sure. So. Um I guess those are two questions. What about the the concern about um, centralization of an authority and then right. protecting the interests of creators? So right now in the register transaction, we are um, sort of acting as an authority, but anyone else can also you know run the spool protocol and um, they can be the issuing address. And we're, we're actually working with marketplaces where they want to also be an issuing address themselves. And so our, we're evolving a protocol to support that. Um, but it's, it's always useful to know that there's a trusted point of origin. So we're not trying to lock that down ourselves per se, um, because um, that, that kind of goes against the vision of, of you know, decentralization and creation, create, supporting creators and all of that. You know, we can provide a lot of value that we do, there's no need for us to lock that down, right? Um, and then the question of like, you know, serving creators. Um, so in Ascribe, we, we talk a lot about our values as a company. You know, we're wildly ambitious, but we also have to be cognizant. Our number one value in Ascribe is creators first. So we're probably going to run up against, you know, people who don't like that. You know, collectors saying, hey, I really want to serve my needs. But you know what? They've had a pretty good run with piracy. <laughs> and we want to see, you know, we want to reduce the number of stories we hear about poor starving artists who are creating great work, who people are stealing their stuff. And, you know, we just want to see them get compensated, whether it's via additions, whether it's via tipping, whether it's via streaming. You know, Ascribe service will support all of those. Um, it's really about getting the, the creators properly compensated for what they do. Cool. Well, I think this is a great, uh, a great note to end on, and it's certainly uh, an awesome and extremely audacious vision you guys are pursuing but i mean i think it's uh, it's very exciting and i think we will we'll, we'll be following closely where is all leads and what it can do to the internet and just sort of our experience with digital content and, and the future so uh yeah 
super excited about you, what you guys are doing and thanks so much for coming on today to discuss it with us. Thank you very much. It's really my pleasure. Thanks for the great questions. Okay, well, we'll have links for uh, all the interesting readings from Spool Protocol to the Scribe website, Contemporary, etc. in the show notes. Uh, and to our listeners, thanks so much for listening. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter with episode of BTC, and uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks, and we'll see you then. In five, four, three. Hello, welcome to episode. One second, one second, one second. Trent, how do we pronounce your last name? Is it McConaughey or? McConaughey. McConaughey. Yeah, McConaughey. McConaughey, okay. Kind of like Matthew McConaughey, except pronounced correctly. (laughs) Yeah, McConaughey. Okay. <laughs> All right. Go to this. Yeah. All right. So the only way that I can actually get a movie that's English that's new release is if I VPN or, or torrent it, and I don't want to be a pirate. So that's really a problem. This pirate trend that she's come up with, Jerry. This this is going to be the new look for the '90s. You're going to be the first pirate. <laughs> well, I don't want to be a pirate. <laughs> So to answer your question, there were sort of two questions there. Um, can you have scarcity in digital? And uh, what about the idea of property in digital at all? And this idea of property in digital at all, it actually goes back to um, the very idea of intellectual property. If you think about the word intellectual property, intellectual means ideas and property means